meditating upon uh, the greatest gift apart from the Lord Jesus and the greatest gift is children. Um, doesn't get spoken of enough. And, uh, but also, I was thinking this morning about sin. And uh, how sin is against all of man's relative good in this world. And uh, <clears throat> sin isn't going to let any husband or any wife or any parents or any children uh, live quietly. It's just not going to happen. And sin, no doubt, breeds multiple types of divisions. And sin breeds multiple types of uh, factions in not only uh, the Lord's church, but also uh, government and these types of things. And there, there's little bitty union with sin. And sin is against the very being of man. You know, how many abortions does sin cause? You ever thought about that? I mean, you don't hear about that, but what is it? 96% of abortions are due to fornication and adultery? You can't be silent about that. How many... Because of sin, it sins not only from the cradle to the grave because of sin. That's the ultimate essence of disunity, I believe, uh, what's going on with our children in this world. And uh, everybody just turns a blind eye. So I want to acknowledge all of those precious children before I even talk about any unity and Acts 2, Psalm 133. I want to acknowledge all the precious children that have been not only ripped from the womb, but ripped from families as well. And um, we'll get into that later. But the title of my message this morning is Unity and Community. And there's been a lot of talk, if you've been following on the political scene, maybe you haven't, and that's, that's great. But there's been a lot of talk about unity. There's one man in particular by the name of Joe Biden who talks about unity. And he's making a call for unity, if you've heard. And uh, I don't want to burst anyone's bubble here this morning, but that is a false flag. And the reason why it's a false flag is because he is totally delusional on what unity even means. Beloved, it's nothing more than demonic political rhetoric. That's all that it is. And um, the Pluribus Unum. You ever heard of that before? Yeah. On the seal. And uh, it's Latin for out of many or one. And uh, the traditional motto of the United States uh, on the Great Seal. The seal was approved by Act of Congress in 1782. There's a picture of it. And uh, it refers to one people or nations or cultures or languages or uh, the great melting pot, one nation under God. Um, but if you haven't discovered, or I guess I should say, if we haven't discovered anything by now in 2021, uh, hopefully we've, if we've learned anything, uh, we've learned that unity isn't going to be attained that easy. It's not. It's not going to be attained that easy. And today, what unity we had uh, is totally fractured by hostile groups who selfishly pursue their own way. And um, what the Lord laid on my heart this past week through inner prompting of Holy Spirit and the written Word of God is that oftentimes the church can be the same way. It can. We're supposed to be, remember that old hymn, Onward Christian Soldier? Onward. 
it says we are not divided all one body. Well, sadly, not only is the nation fractured, but sometimes and more often than not, the church is fractured in regards to unity too. And um, therefore, uh, looking to the Word of God, um, Psalm 133 is about unity. And it's about unity in regards to verse 1, brothers who dwell together. And uh, the title says, obviously, that it was by David. And no doubt a man of many failures and a leader who aspired to bring unity, although he never did that fully. Uh, the later part of his years was filled with civil war due to a uh, son who became demon-possessed and wanted to lead a rebellion and revolt against his own dad. But the question remains for me and for you this morning, and that is this, is unity possible? Sure it is. That's the fruit. That's the beauty of it. But I want to make the claim that genuine or real unity is only going to be possible and then can only be established by the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of His kingdom. That's it. And Psalm 133 is precious, beautiful, gorgeous poetry. And I don't think anywhere else can unity be seen more clear than this passage of Scripture and it's greatly illustrated. So let's look to the text. I've said enough. We need to hear the Word of God. Psalm 133. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. <clears throat> it is like the precious oil on the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life, forever. Father and our God, we thank you. Thank you for your word. I thank you for the supper that Jesus instituted. Thankful, Father, for your holiness, and we're reminded of that. We were a people in need of a mediator. We were we are a people in need of a Savior. And we are such a blessed people. You have provided the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, for us. We ask and we pray, Father, that you would remove any type of hindrances of discord, jealousy, envy, strife. Father, that you would help us to be patient with one another. And Lord, most importantly, that we would desire the beauty and preciousness of being diligent to preserve the unity. Father, we ask and pray that we would not tolerate sin one moment. But that we would strive to hear this precious word that it may change us and conform us into the image of Christ. I thank you for those that are here this morning. And I pray, Father, that we would be edified and enriched and encouraged through the Word. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> me. The context demands our attention here um, in the book of Psalms. As far as the date, I have no clue. Maybe you do, I don't. And I have no way of figuring out the date. And many people have no clue the date, but I could say that it could be anywhere uh, in regards to Israel's history. Uh, 
could be the kind of there towards uh, the, the peak of David's reign. You can read about that in 2 Samuel 5 or 1 Chronicles 12 if you want to. I don't have time to do it. Uh, but, but there was at least a time there or a brief little season where the leaders were uh, for a short time in unity. <clears throat> Maybe it was during that time. Once again, I still don't know. But regardless, what I do know is look how verse 1 starts <clears throat> with the word behold. Now the NIV doesn't use that word, but the original Hebrew Greek or the, the Hebrew text and even the Septuagint, which is the Greek form of the Old Testament, uses that word behold. Behold. Well, what's up with that? Well, so what? Well, I think um, trying to figure out the date, uh, the Lord said move on already. Look at the first word of verse 1. Behold. Okay. And, well, behold draws complete attention. That's a red flag. Because it would have what what seemed to be an extraordinary time by the word behold. So it grabs our attention because we too are living in extraordinary times. So, behold. Moving on. I don't know what else to say other than point number one, the blessing of unity. Yeah, and, and I think the last verse in Paul's letter really reminded me of this because Paul says in Ephesians 6.24, uh, the, the bookend of Ephesians, he says, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it. Uh, Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an uncorruptible love. Now, what's that have to do with the blessing of unity? Well, I think what Paul's referring to there is the fellowship between Christ and his saints. When we join the ranks of the saved and we become in a saved state, that, that's a beautiful thing because <clears throat> the, the soul at that point is giving itself to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and therefore, when we give ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a passionate love that that is there should burst forth in sincerity. It's a sincere love for Jesus Christ. And, and we know that, that Christ sings over those who belongs to him. Zephaniah 3.17, that, that he is a mighty savior and, and that he joyfully sings over those who belong to him. Singing is a great thing. We'll get into that later on too. But which my point is this. Therefore, since Christ loves us, we love those who died, who he died in his, in his stead for them. We love others. We love God's people and we will seek to preserve the unity. So moving on, let's look at a few of those obvious points in Psalm 133. Because we love him, we love others as well. And I want to make some obvious points in regards to unity. <clears throat> Number one, unity is a gift from God. I believe that it is. And, and I think there's two images in Psalm 133, straight from Jump Street, that make that case. Notice this language of anointing with, with oil. And more importantly here, the anointing of an exclusive man that the text David seemed fit to acknowledge, and that was Aaron, the high priest, the brother of Moses. Now, anointing was done, and always, always at God's direction. It was always done on God's terms, and anointing was done in God's way, and might I add, in God's authority. So, so any type of blessing that, that it conferred the anointing was always from God. It was always from God. And, and look at verse 2. Notice the threefold repetition in Psalm 133. Coming down is mentioned three times. That, that You need to acknowledge that now. If we're going to be rightfully dividing the word and faithful students of the Bible, which is what a disciple is, the King James uses the word ran down or went down. But, but I like the original Hebrew because the original Hebrew says running down running down, and then the third time, down. Now, that ought to bring an emphasis on what the text is saying here, because the Hebrew then is using the same verb, down, down, down. And that ought to tell us something. 
blessing. It, it tells us the fact that the blessing of Aaron's anointing was from God. It was not from Aaron. It was from God. It was not subjective. It was objective. It was outside of Aaron. Well, come on, preacher. I need some life application. The kid's preaching in Psalms again. Well, here's the life application. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. And I think, going back to my introduction, one of the most saddest, disheartening things about sin, in studying the doctrine of sin, and we need a very, very, very deep doctrine of sin, otherwise there's no high doctrine of joy. But in studying the doctrine of sin, what we find is that sin separates. Well, I know that. Well, yeah, but it creates disharmony. And, and sin also creates hostility. And it takes God, not any of us, to overcome sin. And it takes God to bring harmony again. Just as the anointing came from God to Aaron, so too, if there's any type of disharmony, if there's any type of hostility, if there's any type of separateness within the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is going to take God to bring unity. Period. And all real unity is, or at least I should say, all lasting unity is only from God. Well, is there any immediate application here for us? I believe so. That's why if there's any people or individuals in the Lord's church engaging in disharmony or hostility or separating or dividing, the best prayer we could ever pray for those individuals is that they come to broken repentance. And if church leadership doesn't deal with their sin and let the dead dog lie, the best prayer we could ever pray for that individual is that God would sovereignly remove them from the assembly. We don't like that language because we like numbers, but beloved, the best thing that could ever happen is that they leave the church. And we don't like that language because we live in America. And we've drunk the Kool-Aid that the gospel has to be nice and polite and, and all that. But what did the Apostle Paul say? Cast them out to Satan. Get them out of there. For the destruction of their flesh that they may come to repentance. And this is a New Testament theme. Ananias and Sapphira had to go. They wanted to be the church bigwigs. God said it ain't going to happen. God killed people in the New Testament too. It's not just an Old Testament thing. <clears throat> they got to go. And I take the position, maybe you don't, but I do, that sometimes the Lord has to subtract before He can multiply. Once again, sometimes the Lord has to subtract before He can multiply. And the second thing that I believe this psalm teaches us here from repetition of the text is that unity is for the small and for the great. It is. It's for the small and the great. That's so what's precious about it. Because notice the second thing that Psalm 133 tells us, this strange language that's very poetic, Mick, and it says that it is of the dew of Mount Hermon falling on Mount Zion. Boy, that's weird. Kind of was a little puzzling at first. But I, I, I instantly knew that it was going to involve a little bit of a geographical study. And that's where we engage in a little bit of brain sweat. And once again, more light, Lord, more light. And it's like, boom, here's your light. You want to engage in a little brain sweat? Holy Spirit says, yeah, you're serious about learning this. So here's what we learn from a little geographical study. It's not too difficult because the little, little geographical study tells us that, that Hermon was one of the highest mountains in Israel. Yeah. On the contrary, Mount Zion was just a little hill. A little pyramid. So what? I think what we have here is a couple metaphors in the psalm. And we must not overlook it. I think the main point is that the dew comes down and it illustrates once again that this unity is from God. The main point is that the dew is for a little bitty Zion. And the dew is for Big Herman Munster. 
Big Herman. Remember him? Fred Gwynn had that big old baritone voice. Is there relevance? I need more relevance. Yeah, I think there is relevance because when a country, when a church, First Christian Church of Peaky Hill, when a family is at peace, it benefits those around them. True. Big or small. Herman or Zion. Which one are you? Are you Herman? Got a big family? Are you Zion? Don't have a big family? Doesn't matter. When you're at peace, when a church is at peace, when a country is at peace, when a family is at peace, it's going to affect everyone. All, all people, man, are going to be blessed whenever your family is at peace. Especially little Zion. The unimportant, right? And the weak. Now flip the script. Likewise, disharmony in little Zion or disharmony in big old Herman is going to affect everyone too. See? What do you what else? What else? Well, I believe also this language in the in the poetry is telling us that this unity is going to spread. It's going to spread. It's going to flow from one person to another. And we have an example here of Aaron. Aaron, the anointing of Aaron. Verse 2 and verse 3 speaks about this. It was a blessing for him. And it was uh, he was a high priest, which therefore meant, in turn, he would what? Bless others, right? Notice the description here. Very interesting. Very interesting. I mean, David is quite the poet. A man of many things. Very good poet. It's a description of the oil running down from his beard. Or the text says upon the edge of his robes. Or maybe your translation says the collar. The same thing. And I, I love, I've got it in my Bible here, kind of interrogated this, but I circle, circle excuse me, precious oil. That, that's interesting. And doing a little study on oil, going back to Exodus, found, once again, the gold mine, the treasure, Lonnie, digging for coal, man, right? And the pin is the crowbar. I mean, that's, you, you can't undermine the pin. Exodus 30, 22 through 24 was the gold mine. The anointing oil was, was blended in myrrh and cinnamon horn. Cinnamon. And cane. So it would have been a, a wonderful fragrance. Pouring that down, it wouldn't have been like Crisco. No, no, man, we're dealing with some top dog stuff here. Some Gio Armani, if you will. Okay. The Exodus 30, 33, it was a, really it was called a perfume. It was a, a, a beauty stench. Wonderful. What are you, what are you saying? I, I'm saying this, that this wonderful fragrance would have followed him wherever he went. That'll preach. 2 Corinthians 2.15 Paul says all those that are in Christ are the aroma of Christ. Or at least we're supposed to be. Paul says you're either the aroma of life or you're the aroma of death. There's no middle ground. Right? Life application. Well, in the same way, a person who's at peace not only with himself or herself. Are you at peace with yourself? You're going to be a, a blessing, man, wherever you go. I don't care if it's the marketplace, Dollar General, Kellerman's. You're going to be a blessing. And that, that, that there's something about her or him. And then it draws that unity, man. People want that. 
They want it. There's something different about her. There's something different about him. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> Look at verse 3. Unity is a precursor. You know, the precursor. Unity is a precursor or a little foretaste of heaven. And look at verse 3. Two words. Life forever. See that in your text? Yeah, it's, it's good and pleasant because it points to heaven. A little, little piece of heaven. We'll get into that later. Moving on. So, number two. We need to talk about the loss of unity today because I think... Okay, we just exposited the text. We're done. <laughs> We're done. No, no, no. We got much more to say because I think there's a loss of unity today. And I think one of the characteristics about unity or one of the things that is certainly uh, noticeable about community or unity it is it's by its absence rather than its presence. Usually, we have a tendency to notice the absence of unity before we have a tendency to notice the presence of unity. It's like that chain. The first thing you notice is not the good change. You notice what? The weak chain. It used to be, though, that unity uh, was a real American ideal, wasn't it? Our country was this... Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that this melting pot of diverse people and uh, you know, everybody came together. They had common goals and common destinies. And uh, to today, no, no one really seems to be working together for harmony. Um, instead, there's these different antagonizing groups like BLM and, and Antifa and, and all of these types of things. And then it's all about individual rights, but yet the rights that they talk about are not precious documents of protecting sacred documents. These kind of rights are the kind of rights we want to stand up for, but the rights they're about is individual rights that have absolutely nothing to do with anything. And, and I think something has, has terribly happened in America in the past 40 to 60 years in regard to how uh, people relate to one another Prior to this, there seemed to be a Christian ethos, which means a Christian ethic that really seemed to dominate the land, and, and most people cared about helping other people. And, and I, I think for a, as a whole that they believed this was the right thing to do. And, but today it seems the majority of people uh, kind of focus on themselves, what they can get out of things. So, interesting read. Uh, sometime is Daniel Yankee Lovich. He was a 1981 sociologist and um, he published a study in the 1970s uh, he did. It was titled New Rules Searching for Self Fulfillment in a World Turned Upside Down. Well, you're like an old dinosaur preacher. I always quote these old guys. It's 2021. Well, we can always learn from people of old, beloved. Stay with me here. This book documented very important stuff. And it documented the, the massive shift that took place in America. And it documented the paradigm shift of values. And what happened, uh, he makes very clear, is that most Americans begin to seek personal fulfillment as their ultimate goal in life, rather than operating on that Christian ethos or Christian ethic of a principle that once seemed to dominate the land and serving and, and sacrificing for others. And, and Americans, uh, for the most part, had always done that previously. And uh, reading on, though, he found that by the late 1970s, what in the world would he say today? I mean, that was 51 years ago. By the late 1970s, 72% of Americans spent much time thinking about themselves and their own inner lives. He goes on to say, quote, so pervasive was this change that as early as 1976, Tom Wolfe tagged the 70s as the, quote, me decade and compared it to a third, third 
religious awakening. Okay, so what? The pursuit of self always affects our relationship with other people. Always does. And let me just stop and say, it doesn't matter if it's communism or socialism or, you know, liberalism or even humanism. They, they promise a pretty picture, but it will make our world more inhuman. It really will. And the failure to relate to other people, they're going to find out will not only hurt them, but it will also hurt us as well. And truth will be exposed. So then there's this guy, Charles Rich. And he wrote a book in 1976 in his best-selling book called The Greening of America. I know, he's got some wild hair. <laughs> we can learn a lot from the 70s. But here's what he said. I want to read a quote from him. Stay with me. He says, quote, <clears throat> Modern living has obliterated place, locality, and neighborhood. And given us the anonymous separateness of our existence. The family. Oh, yeah. The family. The most basic social system. Folks, th this was 51 years ago. And what would he say today about the family in Kentucky that just came out and the mainstream media is not covering any of it, that CPS has taken their kids to ch ch child uh, trafficking? The most basic social system has been ruthlessly stripped to its functional essentials. Friendship has been coated with a layer of impenetrable artificiality as men strive to live roles designed for them. Protocol, competition, hostility, and fear have replaced the warmth of the circle of affection, which might sustain man against a hostile environment. Listen. America has become a terrifying place of anti-community. That's my point. That's his point. Well, it's a lot of quoting. We need the Bible. Yes, I know. But here's the deal. This is important documents. And the important document points to this. Are churches exempt? Are they exempt? Maybe sometimes, perhaps. Not everywhere. And not always, because oftentimes <laughs> our, our churches neglect community. Now, maybe this church doesn't, but as a whole, they do. You just drive to church and listen to the sermon, say hello to your own little group, return home, get the fried chicken, and let's watch the Super Bowl. You see? No community in that. And you can do it all nowadays in America without even having experienced community. Just keep things moving, start on time with jokes, preach to the choir because you know who butters your bread, preacher. Entertain in and out and no community needed. See? So what do we do? What do we say to this? Go back to the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. And once again, only true unity can come from God. be rediscovered, it can be reestablished in the church, but only as men and women are on their knees and we get out of that attitude of America's self-individualism and we submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible shows the way. The Garden of Eden is where it starts. God was looking to the wonderful created cosmos that He had made, ex nihilo, out of nothing into something. Genesis 2.18, it was not good for man to be alone. Quarantine is not of God. Well, if you're sick, yeah, that's just common sense, beloved. That's common sense. Social distancing is not of God. Well, if you're sick, yeah, that's common sense. But no, that's not of God. The only thing we should really be social distancing from is sin. God wanted man to live with relationship. God, God wanted man to live in harmony. 
And so he created a woman. What a beautiful aspect of the love of God. He created a woman. If that don't send chills up your spine, that's a beautiful thing. The man would be able to share the bounty of God's creation with her in the joys of the work of God together. That's our first parents, Adam and Eve. They shared all that, but what happened? It goes back to my introduction. Sin caused the, the, the disharmony. I mean, they were happily married, weren't they? Long while. We read it and think it only they were only married for five minutes because we go straight into Genesis chapter 3, but it was longer than that. They shared in this together. And what happened? Sin so discord between them. Okay, moving on. New Testament. Jesus established the people, a people, a new people of God. And He's the one that saved them from their sin. Brought in to them fellowship. And it's called the Christian church. Or the church of Christ. Matthew 16, 18, and Jesus prayed for the church. And one thing that the Lord prayed is that God would give the people unity. John 17, Jesus prayed and He prayed for, yes, the original disciples and all those who would receive their teaching, their doctrine, their instruction on the foundation of the New Testament church. He said, I also pray for those. That's me and you, beloved who will believe in me through their message. It ain't just about the red letters. It's all of sacred scripture. May they be in us so that the world may believe. You see that? The fellowship, one of the greatest aspects of our evangelism. And I'm not underplying, not, not speaking. Faith goes by hearing. We have to speak. They may be as one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity. Let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And this isn't an artificial, this is not, this is not an enforced unity of tyranny. That's not the way that it is. It's a unity based on a common participation in Jesus Christ and the gospel of God. So what do you do now with this? I mean... What do you do now? Well, we go back to the model church. The book of Acts and that history. Well, Luke was a doctor. Yeah, that's true, he was, but he was also a historian. A great writer. Jesus' prayer, I believe, was answered here because a community came and was formed. The birthday of the church on the resurrection day after resurrection and ascension, but Luke records in Acts 2.42, after they were immersed, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, how do you explain that first to people that have been in church their whole life and heard that? Most of you have been Christians, some of you, longer than I've even been alive. And here there's this little runt coming in. <laughs> How am I going to explain that verse? We're going to pull down Gareth Reese? No, you've heard it before. We're going to pull down Cottrell on that verse? No. Brother Lee Mason? No, it's all good stuff, but you've heard it. It's all good stuff. Those are great preachers and theologians. I'm a mule. They're a thoroughbred. So how am I going to explain this to you? Acts 2.42. What do you do? Well, I'm not a parrot. So I'll just do my best. A large church. <laughs> it was a large church. 3,000 people, beloved. And it was a church that was large, but I think it was also a church that probably had problems. Wouldn't you say? I mean, all churches do have problems, don't they? I think it had hypocrites. It maybe even had some doctrinal errors. Why? Well, because it had sinful humans in the Ecclesia. All types. But it was a model church. It was a model church. The early church, they had a, a strong commitment. And I love those video film strips that you play, Danny. And I, I think that Brother 
explain this very beautifully, and others would too, I'm sure, but they had that strong commitment of fellowship, and they emphasized that really well. It's holding something together in common. That's what fellowship is. It's a common participation in God. We participate together in God. Isn't that cool? It's awesome. That's what it is. Someone has once said, quote, the stronger your vertical fellowship is, the stronger your horizontal fellowship will be, close quote. So true. That's exactly right. The church is a good example of that. But we're going to break down these four elements very quickly. You know them by heart, and that's a good thing. First was the apostles' teaching. And I found this to be very intriguing, and I'm, I'm thankful to, to look at this with a fresh lens. Because once again, I need to present this in a fresh way. And real unity or community is only going to be established, get this, around a common set of conviction in a common set of belief. That's the only way unity can be established first. And it drew these early Christians together in their fellowship. And it was a, a common devotion to the apostolic teaching and preaching of Scripture. I think in those early days, I was thinking about the persecution in those early days of the Lord's church. And I, I think that in spite of of the persecution, which really, get this, might have caused them to focus on more of their personal life, maybe fleeing from the persecution, or these kind of things. I think at the end of the day, the disciples, no doubt, were devoted to Grafe. The disciples, in light of the persecution, it didn't stop them from being devoted to the Scripture. That's what we learned. I would also go as far as to say that that's the first mark of a spirit-filled church. Not their money. How much do they in devour and devour, I should say, the Word of God? Are we dripping Scripture? They say about John Bunyan, if you would have cut him with a knife, he would have bled Biblios. Can that be said about you and me? The second thing was fellowship. They loved one another. They cared for one another. And how do you know? Well, they shared their material possessions. Those were all in need. Moving on, the Lord's Supper, the, the central part of our gathering. And that was a Lord's Day only event, man. And, and there's no evidence in Scripture that they shared the supper on any other day. And the early church never gathered to celebrate the resurrection without a memorial of his death. Fourth is the prayers. You know, that also, looking at Scripture as a whole, means singing. The Psalms are prayers. Singing to God. I don't think that we can just sing songs in our meeting and never have a prayer life. That's not what I'm saying. Colossians 3.16 is singing with thankfulness in our heart. Unity and prayer are inseparably linked. Singing is important with our prayers. Atop a cold peak near California's capital, Governor Gavin Newsom was enjoying the peace and quiet he earned by taking away everything fog in the state. But then he heard something that made his blood run cold. Singing. According to sources, every Christian in County, the tall and the small, was singing without any permits at all. The governor hadn't stopped the Lord's Day from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. What's this? Singing in my state? Newsom cried as he looked down at the small village of Whoville and heard the believers gathered there singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. <coughs> I 
Is that what you desire? And this is God's plan. This is, as Brother Danny said in Sunday school, becoming obedient to the faith. But that obedience is not just here. That's just how you get saved. That's not how you live a godly life. That's just how you enter in. And the obedience also carries over to faithful unto death. Amen. Well, if you have a decision to make, it needs to be done now. Let's pray. Father and our God, we thank you again for the precious psalms, the precious psalms. What a precious church we have. But help us to strive all the more not to get complacent or to grow weary, but Lord, to be joyful and to truly have fun serving you, Lord. No matter what's going on in the world, you've established your church and no gate in hell will prevail against it. So we pray, Father, that we would endure until the end and be faithful in unity, joyfully serving you with zeal. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's